I want to welcome an important person to advocate on behalf of arts and culture in the state of Michigan, and the, he is our next speaker, Mike Finney. Mike is also one of our 2015 MASCO-funded speakers today, this year, and MASCO, we have another speaker coming after him, Ben Forda. Mike is Senior Advisor for Economic Growth at the State of Michigan and formerly the head of Michigan Economic Development Corporation and Ann Arbor Spark. When Mike took his job with MEDC in 2011, the budget for Michigan Arts and Culture grants was just 2.26 million. It had really plummeted down. During Governor Snyder's administration, the budget has grown to 10.1 currently which is really terrific. Why did the administration make that increase? If there's anyone in the state that has a clear picture of Michigan's creative economic growth and strategies, it's Mike Finney. Let's welcome him to the stage. Well, thank you for the, uh, the kind introduction. And uh, I tend to wander a little bit, so I'm going to probably move around the stage a little bit. Uh, you know, I, I, it's great to, uh, to be here. Uh, one of the things that we clearly understand at the state of Michigan is the relative importance of the entire creative sector and how it relates to the overall success of a given location, a given state, in this case, the state of Michigan. Uh, from day one, uh, when I joined Governor Snyder's team in Lansing, Having been a part of Ann Arbor Spark and, and, and being you know, in, tremendously engaged in everything that's happening in the Ann Arbor region and in Southeast Michigan, it was beyond clear that the creative community and all, everything that supports it uh, represented one of those key assets that had to be available to businesses when they were making location decisions. And probably the only thing that I would say is significantly more important than having this kind of creative environment is probably talent. And, uh, and I say that because talent really is the currency in economic growth. If you have talent, you can grow. If you don't have talent, you're unlikely to grow. And Michigan, and this region in particular, has been very fortunate to have an abundance of talent. So our decisions around investing in and continuing to grow uh, this sector was a fairly easy decision. And, and the folks who know what Governor Snyder has been up to and what I've been up to while I was at the MEDC and now in my current role you know that it was not a tough sell to get us to continue investing in the, the creative corridor, creative culture. So with that, why is it so important? What has happened over the last four years that signals that we did the right thing? And obviously, the investments that we've made in the creative uh, 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 cultural uh, assets in our state are not the only things that have driven the results, but it is a very important one. And here's just a few examples of what's happened in the state of Michigan. And if you ever heard Governor Snyder talk, he always talks about reinventing Michigan and how important it was for us to completely redo our state, not just make in incremental changes. We had to reinvent everything that we did. And here's a few examples of some of the changes that have happened here in our state. Uh, Michigan really is a comeback state. If you knew us uh, in 2009, 2010, uh, we were, in fact, uh, number 49 on most key metrics out of the 50 states whether it was employment, job losses, um, unemployment rate, you name it, we were pretty low in all those factors. If you look at us now, boy, have we made an, an amazing comeback. Our GDP outperforming pretty much the rest of the country. Our job growth has been phenomenal during that time period. Unemployment rate has fairly, dropped fairly dramatically. Manufacturing jobs coming back in a big way. And until, for, for many years, we shied away from owning our pedigree as a manufacturing state. And I laugh about that because, you know, somebody's got to make stuff. And if you look at those locations that were thriving during the time when Michigan was suffering, it was those locations, not just in the United States, but, but around the world, who had figured out how to make things better, faster, cheaper than anyone else. So shouldn't we own up to our uh, you know, pedigree, our legacy as a manufacturing state, and say to the world that we want to make things? Well, of course, the answer to that is yes. 
And so we've implemented strategies centered around manufacturing. And I should point out, not just making cars. We're very proud of the fact that we were the car capital and we still make a lot of cars, but we also make cereal. We make pharmaceuticals. We make medical devices. We make furniture and so on and so forth. And in most cases, we're a world leader in all of those. So making things is a very, very important part of this transformation that we've gone through. And of course now, we've gone from not being on the radar screen in terms of new projects and, 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 and project or company expansions to being in the top five states for the last two consecutive years. And we trust that we'll be there again uh, in, the next, in, in 2015. And so that's a, a summary, right? I usually close with this slide to say, you know, the things that we've been doing, are they working? And the answer is, I think this slide points out that a lot of what we've been doing really matters. And so why talk about all this? Because we're here to talk a little bit about creative things, but I thought it's important for you all to have an understanding of how all this stuff fits together. Because if you only argue for or support or lobby for your industry, your sector, you leave an awful lot of other folks on the sideline that really need to be a part of this as well. So I'm here to encourage you to think more holistically about the impact that you have and the relative importance of what you do to all other industries that drive economies in Michigan and beyond. And so here's how we approach that. You know, it's a pretty simple strategy that we have. I'm not a big strategy guy. I don't like writing a bunch of strategies, right? But I am a very strategic person when it comes to figuring out the right things to zero in on and go after and then develop some real clear outcomes that will make a difference in the overall you know, economic impact of our state. So our strategy is really simple, talent enhancement. I said talent's the most important thing in this industry. Frankly, it's the most important thing across all industries, right? If our country wants, wants to be successful, we've got to have the best and brightest, brightest talent that works itself down to states, it works itself down to regions, it works itself down to cities. So we're very focused on having an aggressive talent approach. And you probably heard recently, Governor Schneider reorganized uh, the, all of the economic development and workforce and, and housing agencies into what he's calling TED, or the Talent and Economic Development Team, with talent being the first word in that new department. Businesses and growth is driven by companies of all types, including all of those represented here. And so we've got to have business growth, but it is dependent on talent. And then vibrant communities, likewise. In fact, this sector, if you're young or if you're one of the creative class, you typically want to live in vibrant communities, in urban settings. At least that's the data that we see. And if you're both young and involved in the creative uh, uh, industries, you are highly likely to be living in an urban community or wanting to live in an urban environment. And so we figured that out and decided that it's an important part of what we have to do. And so this is our very simple strategy, right? There's not a big, you know, 100-page document that lays out what we're trying to do. But there are a lot of tactical things that we do behind each one of these that, help that has helped Michigan achieve some of the results that I was able to share in the first slide. For example, uh, placemaking. Right? We, we hear that term a lot. I didn't understand it uh, when I first heard it. I wanted to get a little bit more into the underpinnings of it. And what did it really mean? Well, it meant we had to fix those things that were broke within these urban communities that we were trying to be a magnet for the creative class and for young and vibrant talent. Well, that's simple enough. And then we've developed a checklist of things that tend to be challenges that we had. In other words, what are the shortcomings? What are the things that's preventing us from having the kind of communities that the creative class and that young people want to live in. We didn't have enough mixed-use development, so we focused a lot of our time, effort, and resources on developing mixed-use projects within our communities where there's both live, work, and play. We had a fair amount of blight in many of our urban communities. In fact, I was in Detroit this morning for a breakfast meeting at 7.30, and if you ever get a chance to go to Pancakes and Politics, they only do it four times a year, and it's sponsored by the Michigan Chronicle. I'm doing a commercial in the middle of my talk, right? But Pancakes and Politics is an amazing event, but it's, it's in Detroit. It's headquartered at the Detroit Athletic Club, which is one of the more uh, upscale uh, properties and locations. It's where all the major business movers and shaker, shakers congregate. But you don't have to go very far from the DAC to see significant blight in some of the communities in Detroit. But having said that, I'm going to close out with giving you a vision of where Detroit is going 
and what we've been able to accomplish over the past several years that really signals that we're focused on the elimination of some of that blight that we know we have. You know, developing corridors, nodes, and anchors that really sing the right kinds of messages. Uh, one of the better ones, and I, in fact, uh, when we made the commitment to help establish a Whole Foods right in midtown Detroit, boy, did we get a lot of criticism. You know, you're investing in grocery stores. Those are the kind of things that just show up because people are there, right? You shouldn't have to incentivize uh, grocery stores to locate in communities. But Whole Foods sends a different kind of message about a community, or I could say Bushers or some of the other upscale uh, grocery retailers. They send a different message. They send a message that this is a sense of place. And so we focus on that, and we try to build around that. And then we have issues with infrastructure development, alternative transportation, and alternative workspaces that we've had to develop. So in the real estate space, here's just a, a little bit of before and after. This is an apartment complex in Detroit where we were able to leverage uh, almost $4 million of private money, and we used a grant, in this case, of about $600,000 to leverage it, and you can see the difference between before and after. Another example where we used brown, brownfield and tax increment financing to really change a uh, contaminated and blighted uh, old broken down repair shop into a street front uh, CVS. And you know most CVS, they have a lot of parking spaces right in front and they're set back. We brought this one right out to the street in Traverse City and made it a very attractive project, about a $4.6 million development. And then we're activating all kind of public spaces from Grand Rapids to Detroit, from uh, uh, Monroe County all the way up to Marquette County in the Upper Peninsula. We're doing very creative things to, to activate public spaces. And then in the talent space, we've got a lot of cool programs like Matt Square that's helping to fill the gap that we see for uh, middle skilled kinds of talent, you know, tradespeople and vocational types of, of education. Uh, Live Work Detroit, where we introduce uh, knowledge workers to all the excitement of living and working in Detroit. And by the way, we have a Live Work Ann Arbor and a Live Work Grand Rapids and a few other versions of that as well. And then we have Career Jumpstart that's really focused on helping young people figure out how to get to that next career move in some very exciting ways. In the arts and cultural space, the Michigan Council for the Arts and Cultural Affairs represents Michigan's primary resource that you would connect with. And as was said in the introduction, boy, have we rapidly increased the amount of support that's available to all of you via the Michigan uh, Council for the Arts. And, and that's managed through uh, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. And then there's the Pure Michigan campaign, where we invest nearly $30 million a year to really tell Michigan's story in a pure Michigan way. And I won't say a whole lot more about that, but it has turned out to be the third largest industry in our state, and organizations like the, 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 the CVBs, the Community Convention and Visitors Bureaus in, in, in Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti, uh, represent just wonderful assets that have partnered with us to drive this program in ways that we could have not anticipated just five years ago. And then lastly, I get a lot of questions about Detroit no matter where I go. Folks want to know a little bit more about what's happening because De Detroit went through this bankruptcy. But ironically, during that time, and actually during the last four years, more than $10 billion have been invested in Detroit. You wouldn't expect that from a community that was in the middle of a, a significant restructuring and bankruptcy. But the business community understood that Detroit had hit its bottom. And with this incredible you know, cultural uh, asset base that we have there, I mean, some of the cultural assets are beyond comprehension. Right? We had this big fight about retaining all the assets of the DIA as one example. Things that you can't get any place else in Detroit. Just getting to the DAC, I drove by the gym. I drove by the Fox. I drove by the DAC, uh, DIA and so on and so forth, these incredible cultural assets. So Detroit is a big part of that here in Southeast Michigan, and of course, all the assets that we have here in, in the Ann Arbor area. So I thought I would close by giving you a video representation of what's happening in Detroit so you get a better idea of what I mean. Hopefully it'll play.
for helping to contextualize the reinventing Michigan strategies. They brought a great deal to Michigan and to the creative sector. And I want to thank you for the Whole Foods downtown where I stopped yesterday to pick up my lunch as a person who works in the city. Um, Mike cannot stay for our cultural living room this afternoon, so I want to invite you to come up. We have the microphone again set up over here. So if you have any questions, if you guys at your table wrote anything down on a card, please come up and use the microphone. Make sure that it gets on DPTV's uh, live stream, and uh, we'll invite some questions. Jennifer? Hi. Say your name and where you're from. Jennifer Conlin, and I'm a journalist who covers Detroit, but I'm also, um, I also have a nonprofit, Arts Journalism Project in Detroit. Um, my question is, you have so many creatives moving into the city, and I've talked to Dave Enger because the Hudson Weber Initiative, the 15,000 people moving to Detroit by 2015, appears to have been met. There's so many young people. But as they're getting older, they're worried about where their kids are going to go to school and keeping them particularly because they can't necessarily afford to go out to the private schools. How are you going to keep this creative group in Detroit as the city gets better, prices also go up, but schools are a big part of that? Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so uh, you know, schools and the neighborhoods are the next big challenge that has to be tackled in Detroit. Uh, the Midtown, Downtown, that central business area, which represents about five square miles, is actually coming along at a pace that probably none of us could have envisioned a few years back. But the neighborhoods are still lacking, the schools are obviously, obviously still lacking, but there are a number of efforts that are underway. There's a commission that was, that's being led by community folks who have decided that they, they, uh, they want to enjoy some of the same uh, prosperity that's happening within the business community. They want to enjoy that in schools and in the neighborhoods. And that commission is underway, and they're actually scheduled to present a, some, a set of recommendations to Governor Snyder uh, someplace near the end of this month, about the 31st of this month. And so I'm looking forward to seeing what the outcomes are of those recommendations. And I know Governor Snyder, uh, he loves seeing the kind of collaboration among both the public, the private sector, the foundation community, and I'm pretty sure if the, the recommendations are, are substantive, uh, he's going to be interested in trying to implement them as effectively as possible. Uh, I don't know much about schools and how to fix education, so I won't try and go there but it's pretty obvious that something has to be done. With respect to the neighborhoods, uh, there's just beautiful properties. I'm around Detroit all the time in the neighborhoods. The challenge is figuring out how to get mortgage financing and a few other things done in Detroit uh, that uh, are, are challenges right now. Uh, believe it or not, there were less than 400 mortgages issued in the city of Detroit last year. That's a city with 350,000 or so uh, housing units. In a normal real estate environment, uh, those homes would turn over about every seven to eight years. So you get the picture of how big of a disconnect there is between mortgage financing and what's actually happening in Detroit. How to fix it, uh, we've got some things in the works. I don't want to get out ahead of the process, but we are working on some things. Governor Snyder has asked me to get directly involved, and I'm actually working with a number of other organizations to try and come up with some creative solutions. I think, unfortunately, we only have a couple more minutes, so I'm only going to be able to take probably two more questions. Why don't you come up and I'll ask I'll be quick with my question. responses, and my email is there. So if I don't answer the question, email it to me, and I'll get a response back to you. And, and make sure to write it down on your card and share it with your table and with us later. Yeah, hi, I'm Ruth Knoll. I'm the founder of Summers Knoll School in Ann Arbor and now the Clinton Arts Center in Clinton, Michigan. Um, there's a huge amount of uh, development going on in the urban setting, which is, is working. Uh, where does this leave rural development, uh, where there's no services, no transportation without your car, and what I just learned in um, at the school board meeting is 30% of our students uh, are failing, uh, and the Clinton Public School elementary schools are now the uh, Department of Education focus school. Yeah, yeah so again, I, I can't offer too much with respect to the education component and how that's being fixed. I think the Department of Ed and and some of the strategies that the governor is, is helping to lead will ultimately speak to that. But in terms of you know, development in rural areas, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a bit challenging mm -hmm. to think rural and then think development because uh, one is, th they're the inverse of each other, right? And so uh, we also know that uh, the talent, the young talent in particular, 
that we're coming across really want to be in urban areas. So as we make choices about where to, where to focus our limited resources, we're focusing, focusing those resources where talent is telling us they want to be, which is much more concentrated in the urban communities right now. It's not to say that we are not trying to do projects in, in, in rural communities, but we're more opportunistic there rather than intentional uh, because of the, just the limited resources we have. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, one last question, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Jane Thompson, I'm out of uh, Chelsea, Michigan, and mine's an extension of that question about um, uh, what's been done about the cities within Detroit. I'm thinking of Hamtramck and Highland Park and then some of the other suburb suburbs around going north to Port Huron. They seem to be left out. So much money's going into Detroit. What about the other areas? It, well, with respect to the two that are inside of Detroit, everybody knows Detroit. There's two cities inside of Detroit, Hamtramck and Highland Park. Uh, we are trying to provide the same kind of, of uh, support and creativity in, in terms of investment in those communities that we are in Detroit. So we're really not treating those any differently. But we are trying to make sure that, uh, uh, that it is private sector led. So all the development that you see happening in Detroit is actually being led by the private sector with the state being there to fill gaps that exist. And so uh, to some extent, given our limited resources, you may not see as much happening in Hamtramck or Highland Park as you see in the midtown and downtown Detroit areas. But remember, uh, those two communities are outside that midtown to downtown area, and so they are subject to the same kind of, of needs that the neighborhoods are in Detroit. And so their timing will probably be similar to the timing that we start to, to see some positive impacts in the neighborhoods within Detroit. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Thank for your you time. Mike.